Hello everyone and welcome back to Realism Overhaul Sandbox in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. In this video I reintroduce the Shinkansen space plane system which I had designed in the rocket science series and sort of test flew but was never able to do re-entry with. Uh, re-entry always went a little bit wrong. I have since rebalanced it a little bit and I think I've got it so it can re-enter safely. We are going to find out. Uh, so those of you who don't know about this system because it's been a while. Um, the premise is that we have two identical planes you can see here. On the left side is the carrier plane, on the right side is the space plane. The carrier plane is completely filled with fuel, no kerbals in. So the entire body is just what a big fuel tank. Well, a series of big fuel tanks really. There's those in the back, there's a tank in the middle, and then there's the RCS tanks in front. A uh, bit of fuel in the RCX tanks up front is locked so that it can use that to maneuver so that it can land safely after it's done its work. Also we have uh, two boosters on this side and one booster on that side and that is because of balance basically and also to help out with the delta V that we end up with in orbit. This is a fairly light system on the launch pad, it was about 500 tons and um, that's about the same as a Falcon 9 so yeah it's pretty efficient the body of the space plane dry is about 27 28 tons so that's a little bit more than the capacity of falcon 9 and if you work it out um, well we're using methane and oxygen engines these are the ed4 engines featured in my mars colonization series uh, two of the vacuum engines on the space plane and then the sea level engines on the boosters and the carrier plane and so with the added efficiency of the methane and oxygen you get about you know a little bit more than 27 tons to orbit unfortunately my boosters even though i tried to have recovery systems on them they had parachutes on them and everything uh, well when they meet bad aerodynamic forces they tend to explode and rip apart sometimes they'll work out sometimes they don't anyway uh, so, the space plane has the Kerbals. It doesn't have much payload capacity, like I said, when you figure it all out with the efficiency of methane and oxygen and sort of compare it with uh, Falcon 9, you don't get a whole lot more uh, payload, uh, a whole lot more capacity to orbit than the dry mass of this space plane, as the carrier plane turns off some of its engines to maintain balance along the way up. Incidentally, the carrier plane does cross-feed fuel into the space plane, so the space plane will have its full fuel load once the carrier plane goes off. So, and one reason why it has to do that engine off uh, to maintain balance is because the space plane's engines can't be tilted to through the center of mass. They have to be tilted through the space plane's own center of mass, not the combined center of mass of the two. And the reason for that is that the space plane's engines can be used for translunar injection. The goal of this is not for low Earth orbit. It's not very efficient. Well, it's actually pretty good for that when you think about it, but um, without the additional payload capacity, it still would have a pretty good crew capacity, sort of like a Dragon capsule, except cozier. Um, but it doesn't have any sort of payload capacity. What it's really for is to transfer the Kerbals all the way out to the Moon. And if you refill its fuel tanks in orbit around the Earth, it can go to the moon, get into orbit, rendezvous with a station in any orbit around the moon really, and uh, come back and use its prodigious surface area to recapture into a low earth orbit by making maybe two or three passes. And uh, the first pass has to bring it down below the Van Allen belts, otherwise that would be bad for radiation purposes, but, um, or at least try to avoid Van Allen belts as much as possible but yeah so that's the general idea and th that's why its surface area is not a detriment because with a pod you can't do that uh, you know you can't just try and cycle back down into low earth orbit to be refueled first of all the pod uh, in order to use its heat shield has to dump its service module right uh, so it's lost the ability to be refueled in the first place plus it dumped its uh, transfer stage a long time ago and there goes our carrier plane so if we take a look at where that goes off uh, this is about the length we're talking about so it can't really uh, actually it probably shouldn't be launching from Cape Canaveral at all better to launch from Texas and then on a trajectory like this the carrier plane can probably land 
in New Orleans. And that would be probably a good deal. Or, you know, Alabama if a certain senator wants to. Anyway, but uh, that's a different business. You can see the space plane itself uh, with its full fuel load has like 6,000 meters per second. It can be refueled with either the SLS Block 1B or, well, now that Elon Musk has given us new numbers, I used to think that it could be refueled with one launch of Starship, but not a Block 1 st Mark 1 Starship. Mark 1 Starship, apparently the dry mass is 200 tons. That cannot carry a fuel load for this. Um, but he said that the Block 4 or 5 would be 120 tons dry. Those could carry the fuel load for this. So we'll have to wait until a Starship Block 4 or 5. And uh, again, that's with the full stack, of course. Not just Starship. Starship now with a 200 ton dry mass is not an SSTO either. So that's a little bit disappointing. Anyway, uh, the space plane was modeled by me in Blender. And except uh, the only parts that aren't modeled by me are the B9 procedural wings. And of course, you recognize the stock fins there. Um, those could possibly be omitted. I put them there because it was having yaw problems, but maybe that's been fixed. We'll see. I would basically have to move the center of mass forward. And actually further forward than I thought was strictly necessary. But I had experience with the space shuttle fixing its problems and realized that this was having the same problems. It does have a cargo bay, but really the only thing in the cargo bay, that's why it has that uh, sort of outline there. You can sort of see where the doors are. Um, the reason it has the cargo bay is ba mainly for the docking port and so that I can dock to a station and also to get refueled. So um, that's the really the only thing in the docking bay right now. I mean cargo bay right now. Anyway, uh, otherwise the cabin is in the forward part. I made the tanks separate to make sure that their mass is applied in the right place. And also in here We've got the RCS, well that's the cabin mass, that's actually where the Kerbals are sitting, it's a separate part, again, to apply the mass in the right place. And then this is the Ford RCS tanks. Same idea, to make sure the mass is in the right place. Otherwise we have the structure of the space plane, and how I calculated all this out is in the rocket science series. So, the main problem has been to... Uh, to get it back down again. Really, the goal for the design is to have it stay in orbit for a very long time. So it'll get into lower orbit, re be refueled, go to Mars, uh, the moon, not Mars. Uh, Mars it can't quite do. Uh, moon, capture around the moon, drop Kerbals off, bring Kerbals back, uh, come back to low Earth orbit by cycling back using its uh, surface area, and um, it'll have its transfer stage here and get refueled and then go back to the moon come back and really not go back to the ground for like years maybe I mean cuz the Air Force has that X-37B in orbit for like two years so I figure that's okay uh, X-37B has its own heat shield and needs to avoid micrometeorites as well presumably and all that business so if it can stay in orbit for two years I don't see why this can't and so after two years, it might need repairs or something like that, and it has to come back down. Minor repairs can be done in orbit at the stations. And um, so after a few years, after a few cycles between the moon and back, it comes back down for the necessary refurbishment and repairs. But otherwise, it would stay in orbit for a very long time, hopefully. And of course, that means that, you know, the... The uh, tile issue can obviously be serviced at stations if necessary. The, the heat shielding is basically the same as the space shuttle's heat shielding. That's how I calculated its mass. So it, would have, it wouldn't have the problem of the external tank having the foam collide with it, obviously, because, well, on the other side we have another space plane. So there's no foam. <laughs> to, and, of course, there's no hy hydrogen involved on either side. So there wouldn't be any foam issue but uh, yeah uh, so but in case there's some tile issue it can be checked out in a station before they come back and uh, it could if you really want to be brought back down on automated basis the Kerbals you know once they get back into lower floor bit if they need to come back down they would come back down with a normal capsule that's not a big problem um, the interesting thing about this is it integrates the transfer stage, the OMS system, the you know basically the service module, and the cabin, the spacecraft. 
and you can reuse all of those. Unlike with a pod where you have to dump the service module and the transfer stage to use the heat shield on every trip. Okay, so that basically uh, gives the justification of it. People often ask about, well, the heavy wings. Well, that's why there's the heavy wings, but also they're not really that heavy. Just the back end needs to be the shape just to fit the fuel tanks there. And so really, and they're not really wings, they're lifting body sort of thing. The difference being that wings are a different sort of structure. Uh, they're actually connected through the body of aircraft and they sort of have, have a different internal structure than these kinds of things do. So it's a little bit complicated to explain without showing. So, but anyway, the, this would be much lighter than something like the space shuttle's wings or anything like that. Also, making it lighter is better power distribution systems, hopefully, in the modern world, lighter computers, and um, a lot of other business. Though, I imagine the safety features, judging from the mass of Orion compared to Apollo, uh, NASA seems to like a lot of safety features these days that they didn't have back then. I've omitted those. Anyway, we need to shut off these engines. I'm going to try and bring it back down again. Uh, whoops, no shutdown. Raise extension is what I want. We need to tuck in the nozzles. So the reason these have uh, extendable nozzles is because they have to light on the ground. But it's not efficient to have the huge nozzle on the ground, right? Because then it'll have very low ISP on, at the surface. So it keeps the nozzles retracted, so it's using just the uh, surface nozzle, basically. And then once it gets to altitude, it extends the nozzle to get the better ISP. Okay, uh, so with that hopefully clear, we are going to activate the OMS and RCS. And I'm going to lift this to a one and a half hour orbit. Unfortunately, the body flap down here doesn't quite cover the engines. Uh, that's uh, basically the limitation of the width of the procedural B9 procedural control surfaces. Also, the engine bells should uh, tilt up whenever these control surfaces tilt up so that they're not banging into each other. Um, but they, you might occasionally see them clipping each other, unfortunately. We don't have a whole lot of delta V once we get to orbit, so let me just stop the smart ASS right there. I'm gonna light the OMS engines. The OMS engines are my ED-1 engines, which were also designed in the rocket science series, the first video of it. And they were actually meant as lander engines, Avril. So in order to get the center of mass right, we'll basically have to have most of the equipment up front, which is fine. One of the annoying things about the space shuttle is that it basically had the fuel cells in the back. And that's not convenient because most of the stuff that needed electricity was in the front. So they had to wire everything across the space shuttle. You ended up like with five tons of wires in the space shuttle, which, you know, we would like to avoid. And that's one thing that contributes to this being lighter. Other thing is not the huge wings and not the huge engines. Uh, these are much lighter engines. We only have uh, 2,000 kilonewtons compared to 7,000 for the shuttle. And uh, these are gas generator engines, so much simpler as well. We are going to use KOS. Uh, I use KOS on launch so that I could talk. And besides, it does a better job of handling things and on the timing, like with the engine shutdowns. And I will also have it handle re-entry for consistency because we are still basically in a testing mode and I, I'm i essentially using the space shuttle re-entry script and I haven't quite fine-tuned it for this yet but if I'm trying to do it manually that doesn't give me any data so uh, I need KOS to do it consistently so I get data. Okay, let's round this out. The Shinkansen, Shinkansen means uh, new trunk line or new train line in Japanese. It's what they call their bullet trains. I figured it was a good enough. I, it, it sort of looked like uh, the front end of a bullet train. At least its nose did to me. Oh well, okay, maybe not. But actually the original name for it was Hamster. <laughs> uh, I don't know why. Okay, so here we go. Our next go around will be lined up with Cape Canaveral 
and we have 300 meters per second left so it's actually a little bit front heavy because the forward RCS tanks drain last so to make sure that the center mass is pretty far forward. I have made adjustments to the script of course this is so much lighter than the shuttle and the periapsis that the script goes to is dependent on the mass so that has been changed and also it's a little bit tough to say how it needs to be but I decided to give it more of a pitch up so it goes to a pitch up of 45 degrees instead of 40 for the shuttle and we'll see how that goes Okay, we have ignition of the OMS. Okay, I really should go into... I should have been in free mode for quite a while now. It does have a little bit of trouble like turning forward after this burn, like starting right about now. I'll probably put caps lock on for between 135 kilometers and maybe 90 kilometers. So it doesn't need to use that too much during that point. I thought I'd fixed uh, little gaps here. I actually changed this uh, from the original version I had in the Rocket Science series. Uh, I reshaped it in many subtle ways, but that left uh, certain imperfections in the mesh. I deliberately kept it simple so that I could change the shape of it if I felt it was necessary to do so. And I actually shortened the whole thing. Um, because I figured I didn't need that much space. It's still pretty darn long for any sort of lifting body. But um, yeah, uh, it had to be at least this long because of the carrier plane side being uh, needing to fit that fuel tank. So any shorter and it can't fit the fuel tank. So had to be this big. Unfortunately, I still have little decoupler bits down there, I know. The, oh, the landing gear is the stock landing gear, so keep that in mind. Yeah, it just has a painful time trying to roll this over. <laughs> and uh, actually, the space shuttle, they contemplated having roll thrusters on the outer edge of the wings, but they figured that would be too complicated to send fuel through the wings and all. Probably for the best not to do that, and I haven't done it here, but that would certainly help with roll control. Well, that's a nice sunrise. Once it settles down, I'll put caps lock on. Okay, we're getting close to where the fine controls are being maxed out, so I'll have to take off caps lock at about 90 kilometers as I expected. That's consistent with testing. I've only landed it once. So I have succeeded once, otherwise I wouldn't be recording right now. But since I've only done it once, there's no guarantee it's going to repeat that, though. One hopes. But on that one try, of course, I started out in somewhat of a different situation. We were in a light, slightly different orbit this time. We'll see how it goes. The one time I did land it, I landed in Florida, but not back at Cape Canaveral. So, still a little far away from the Cape. And so some tweaking of the re-entry script happened, but was it right? We will see. It is trying to lift the nose up right now. I've I noticed this. And that is interesting. As expected, uh, a little bit nose heavy because of the RCS tanks. Obviously, the more the RCS is used, the more that will be solved. We're approaching the west coast of North America. Well, the pitch has more or less settled down now. It's a little bit wiggly, but the roll is persistently an issue. Okay, we are headed over the Gulf of Mexico, south of Houston, basically. That's the coast of Texas. And looking to be on track, we'll see when it picks up again. Counting here, we are a little bit too close to Florida, it thinks. So it's pitching up a bit to get extra drag. We will see if that is the correct decision. Okay, we are approaching the coast of Florida. And that's Tampa Bay to our right. And it's trying to turn a little bit towards Cape Canaveral. We're slowing down quite a lot. 
and we seem to be on track, so that's good. Um, it did not flip. <laughs> I mean, that's that's goal number one. It did not flip. It was reasonably balanced, but you can see it used some delta V here, uh, so it did use up some of its RCS fuel, and we would like it to use as little of that as possible, but getting that exact is quite a trick. That's what, you know, NASA scientists are for in their fancy computers and everything. I don't like it maxing out roll here. Don't ask me why there are flame effects here, but there are flame effects here. We're still a bit a ways, so I'd like to actually take control before it loses too much speed. That's Orlando in front of us. Uh, it'll actually give me control at 10 kilometers altitude. Maybe that'll be enough, but I feel like we're gonna land short. Okay, I have control. Glide is a strong word for what we're gonna be doing, but sort of extend our range a bit. Just getting rid of the remaining fuel here and possibly giving ourselves a little bit of a boost while we're still in vacuum. This needs to be balanced empty in particular, after all. There we go. Okay, I'm going to use uh, atmospheric autopilot to smooth out. You saw I was oscillating in pitch there a bit. Atmospheric autopilot stops that. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to make it all the way. Guess we can check the glide ratio. We have to keep a constant velocity. Uh, that's increasing. That seems close to stable. So we're going down 30 for every 221. 221 divided by 30. 7. Glide ratio of 7.3. I think that's better than the shuttle, but we're lighter. We're actually losing speed, so it's probably worse than 7.3. But that does suggest that we should land at a lower speed than the shuttle. I mean, I can see the Atlantic Ocean from here. So we're not that far. <laughs> no, it seems to be doing okay. Very nice. All right. Very nice indeed. Don't even need the drogue chutes or anything. Thank goodness the land is fairly flat around here. All right, well, it landed somewhere. It didn't land quite at Cape Canaveral. We're not that far away. You can see there's the Cape, and there's us, there's Orlando. Basically, we're in Titusville. <laughs> I wonder if there's, there is a runway in Titusville somewhere. But anyway, uh, so a few kilometers away from the Cape. Oh, stupid clouds. We're, we're there. There's where we were trying to land. And that's the situation. So anyway, Shinkansen space plane, I kept it fairly simple as far as its body structure in order to test things out, but I think I should spruce it up a bit and make it look a little bit better. But for now, that is the system. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.